Hello and thanks for watching the Godly Rebels channel. I am JD and I want to talk a little bit about my new book. Just a little short book here called In the Beginning, The Eight Days of Creation. I know what you're thinking. Where does this guy get eight days from? Because everybody's read Genesis chapter one and there are only seven days mentioned. God creates for six days and he rests on the seventh. Where's the eighth day? Well, it's actually in the title. In the beginning is the eighth day. And throughout the whole book here, I explain in great detail and dissect Genesis chapter one and two, try to prove best I can how in the beginning is actually a new moon day. So in case you didn't know, in the Bible times, the way they kept a calendar was by the moon. Well, actually the sun, moon, and stars all together. The sun is every day. When the sun comes up again, it's a new day. So that's the days. The moon, when it goes through its cycles, it waxes and wanes. That's a month. Think month. That's where that comes from. Month comes from moon. And then we've got 12 main constellations in the ecliptic that the sun goes through. It, so the sun cycles through those 12 constellations, and that is a calendar year. 12 moons. 12 moons. Back in Bible times, that's how they kept time. That's how they kept a calendar. And it was a lunar calendar. And every lunar month begins with a new moon when it renews. So it's dark, and then you start counting one up to 29 or 30 days. That's how they did it back then. When I dissected Genesis chapter 1 and 2, I found that in the beginning is like, you could say a code name for a new moon day. Pretty cool. If you're interested, if you're intrigued, get the book because it goes into more detail. So now I'm just going to go through uh, just reading the titles a little bit just so you can see what all is inside this book here. Chapter one is pretty uh, introductory. Uh, chapter two there, it's, I explain a pretty cool mnemonic device that you, you may or may not know, but those are the six days of creation. So essentially, day one, God is creating a habitat for what will be the sun, moon, and stars. And then day two, God separates the waters above and below, which is where he puts the birds and the fish. And then God creates the land on day three. And then on day six, he creates a man and beast. So essentially, days one through three, God is creating the habitats for what he will, uh, when he creates these things in days four through six, he puts those in the habitats. So that's a pretty cool thing in case you didn't know that. So the next chapter is when did time begin? And this is a huge question. We keep time nowadays and even back in Bible times, keep time by the sun, moon, and stars. But if the sun, moon, and stars weren't created until day four, then what about the previous days, one, two, and three? And how about a definition of time, too? Here's a simple one that I got from Dr. Douglas Hamp. He's got a YouTube channel, a lot of good stuff on there. Time is the measurement of change. So if there's change, then time is passing. So a broader example is constructing a house. You take an empty lot, you come back two or three months later, and you've got a house completely finished. Two or three months is the time that it took to change. So time is a measurement of change. So if you use that definition and go back to days three or two or one, there is change happening, but how is time not happening? That's what confused me for the longest time until I figured out in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He actually created everything, all material substance he created in the beginning. And then days one, two, and three and four, he's creating with material that already exists. So think about this. When was water created? You might say day two. But there's no language of that whatsoever in day two. All God is doing is separating the waters above from the waters below. That's it. He didn't create waters. If anything, he made a firmament to hold up the waters. Think about that for a little bit. And what about day three? God 
created the land? Well, not really. It says that God moved the land around and the dry land appeared. Again, no language of God creating anything. When did time begin? Was it day four? Was it day one? Or was it in the beginning? I'll let you mull that over a little bit. The next chapter is what did God really create? And the chapter after that is create or form. Those kind of go together. So I really dig into the Hebrew on this. There is a difference between creating from nothing or forming. And I kind of explained that a little bit. So the language that God is using, let there be light. Let the waters be divided. It's not creating language. It's not creating from nothing. Ex nihilo comes from the Latin to create from nothing. But that's very, it's a poor translation. In the Hebrew, the word that's used is bara, to create something new or to start something new. And that word bara is only used three times in chapter one. So that might get you thinking a little bit too. <laughs> Did God, God didn't create the waters. He didn't create the land on days two and three. So where those three terms appear is verse one. In the beginning, God created, but out the heavens and the earth. And if we take that as literal as possible, what's included in the heavens? The sun, moon, and stars, and he created the earth. And on the earth, if we read verse two, there's the waters because the spirit is hovering over the waters, right? So in the beginning, God literally created everything. And then days one, two, three, and four, he's forming things. So there's a, there's a difference between creating and forming. And I dig into the Hebrew on those chapters. So the other two places where bara or start something new is used in Genesis chapter one is during the days five and six. In day five, God is creating the mammals. And it says that he's taking the water and the earth and forming mammals. But that's not creating something new because those materials already exist. But he adds the breath of life into the mammals. Therefore, the word bara is used because it's he's creating something new. He's starting something new. And then, of course, on day six... It's the same thing with man and beast. He's forming man out of clay and water. We are 70% water after all. But he's adding the breath of life to the man, to the beast, to all the mammals on days five and six. Therefore, the word bara is used. He's starting something new. So if we look at the whole of Genesis chapter one, when bara is only used three times. The word for creating, right, is only technically used three times. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created all material substance. And then on days five and six, when he adds the breath of life to the mammals. Those are the only three times that word is used in Genesis chapter one, not days one, two, three, or four. So it really makes you think, he, he's not starting anything new in day one or day two. He's not creating water. He's forming. He's manipulating. He's changing his creation. He's molding the earth. He's forming and filling what was void and empty, right? So it's pretty cool once you understand the Hebrew words instead of just these English translations. The next one is let there be a sequence. Another cool thing in the, the Hebrew language is that each of the verbs, there's something called sequential form, and they're like linking verbs. They connect each other. So each day on its own has a sequence. So let there be light. That's the beginning of the sequence. It's like the head. And then the next sequence, the next linking verb is, you know, God saw that it was good. Uh, he named, the, he separated them first, I believe. He separated the light from darkness, and then he called the light day, called the darkness night. And then there was evening, and then there was morning. All of those verbs linked together to create a sequence of events. Finalized, wrapped in a bow by saying day one. So you got this sequence that happens from light 
to doing all those other things, the evening and morning, day one. That's a 24-hour period, which is pretty neat how God wow, wrote that out and how God designed time. There is a sequence in each day. Day two starts a new sequence, and then all those other verbs are linked together. That's pretty cool. Go into detail with that. Separating light and darkness is the next chapter. And this is cool. This is where I get the idea for the the artwork on the, on the front page here. This is how God separated the light and darkness. Pretty cool. The sun is outside the earth, and the, the earth is a globe, a sphere. So we know that at any given time, the light does not touch the darkness. They are divided. But in order for that to happen, on day one, when God separated the light and darkness, there needs to be an earth, and there needs to be a sun. So by putting all these pieces together, this is how I came to the conclusion that in the beginning, it is literally God created everything, including the sun, moon, and stars, because there is patches of, passage of time. Time is passing. There is evening and morning. How can you have evening and morning if there is literally just light and darkness? You know, in, in Sunday school, I saw the those felt boards going through the days of creation. And day one was literally a black square with like half of it white. How is that possible? And it doesn't make any sense. Because once you put a light in a dark room, it's there's no straight line down the middle. It's diffused light. So in order for God to separate light from darkness, as soon as day one, there had to have been a sun and an earth for it to happen on. And that leads me into the next chapter, which is day and night frame of reference. We need the earth to have a frame of reference for all of these terms that we're using. Day and night, right? It's not just light and darkness. It's day and night. Well, how does day and night make sense unless there is an earth? If there is no earth, day and night doesn't make any sense, right? Neither does evening and morning, which again is passage of time. So the sun is moving around the earth, giving it evening and morning. These are the three options, really. The light it has to be moving around the earth in order to give passage of time. Or the earth is the center and the light is moving around. Or I'm going to go with the third one here, where God created everything in the beginning, just the way it is today. Everything in the beginning, the sun, the moon, the stars. And that's really when time began in that instance. This way you have passage of time. You have day and morning. You've got the frame of references and everything makes sense. Why not the first day? Uh, I don't want to get into all of that. <laughs> Too much to explain. A uh, couple other chapters, but I'm just going just gonna to point out one more here that I think is important. When was work wrapped up? So now I'm going to read Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And remember that in the original manuscripts and autographs, there were no chapter or verse markings. So it just read continuously. So when I say Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, I really believe it should be connected to chapter 1. Because it's God is finishing what he did in chapter 1. So let's just read it. This is verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. That may seem a little redundant in the English, but in the Hebrew, it, there's so much going on in just, in just this one verse. Now, you can read other translations, and they will say, by the seventh day, God finished the work which he had done. But that, if I can use strong language here, an abomination, because it is, it is mistranslating what God originally wrote in the Hebrew. Because what those other translations are implying is that God only created in six days. But that's not what the Hebrew says. If you look very intentionally at the verb forms in this verse, 
it is saying and stating that God did create on the seventh day. Please confirm this. Look it up for yourself and confirm it. But this one verse here proves there was a day in the beginning. There was a new moon day. So here's how it works. How can God create on the seventh day and rest on the seventh day? Because those might seem like they contradict each other. You can't have a Sabbath rest and still work on that Sabbath. It doesn't make any sense. But here's how it works. If you have a new moon day in the beginning, it does work. If you count the days that God did create, he created on new moon day, which was in the beginning, created for seven days. That's the seventh day of the month. But then there's very special language there that transitions from the monthly count to the weekly count. So then God rested on the seventh day of the week. So that's an explanation of Genesis 2 verse 2. So just in chapter 1 and a little bit of chapter 2 of Genesis, God is literally setting up a calendar. He's telling his people how to count time. From sunrise to sunrise is one day. You start the monthly count with a new moon in the beginning. And then he gives us the week where you work six days and you rest the seventh day of the week. It's really cool. I could really geek out about this. Oh, and I did. I, I wrote a, a little book here. And this is actually a precursor to a bigger book that I'm writing and hopefully releasing in the next month or two. It's called The Calendar Christ Kept. This book started out as a single chapter in that other book, but it grew too big as I was researching the calendar. And I just found so much information in Genesis chapter 1 that I put it in its own binding. So I hope you'll check it out. It's called In the Beginning, The Eight Days of Creation. I am J.D. Thomas. Follow along if you want to learn more about the calendar Christ kept, which is a lunar, biblically-based calendar uh, using only scripture. If you learn something new, share it with a friend so they can learn. Don't forget to put on the full armor of God every day, and God bless.